think this is one of my absolute favorite times of year, of course, to, to, especially not just to, um, because of Christmas, but getting up and preaching and, and coming to church especially. Whether, whether I'm preaching or not, just, just coming into the house of God at this time of year, it means a lot to me. Um, you know, there's a lot of memories, of course, with, uh, with family, and Christmas time has always been a, a great time of year. But, I, you know, I, I thank God, and my sermon isn't about this, but I just want to say, you know, beware of the, the, the people on the Internet that want to just, they, there's, there's all kinds of nonsense out there, especially when it comes to good things, you know, like, like people want to be against, look, I'm all for being against sin. I'm all for taking the Bible literally. I'm all for all these, you know, a lot of things. And, I, and I'll preach hard on a lot of stuff. But people have a tendency to go a little bit overboard and take things too far. And the people that want to say, oh, you know, celebrating, go, Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, and all these holidays are bad, and you shouldn't be, you know, it's like, it's a bunch of nonsense. Just, just take a step back for a second and, and look now look, is, are there a lot of wicked things and bad things that have that have people tried to wrap into Christmas or that other people do that's not right or that's wicked? Sure there are. I mean, is Christmas about Santa Claus and lying to your kids and telling them that there's this, this man who can see everything you do and, you know, all this creepy stuff, he's going to creep into your house and, you know, is, is that what Christmas is about? Is that why we come here to church this morning? Is that what we're celebrating? No, of course not. And, and should those things be? No. Or, or the, the commercialism and, and trying to get everyone covetous and just focused on just spend, 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 spend. Is that what Christmas is about? No. And those things are wrong. And you know what? I will preach against those things. But what other time of year can you literally turn on a worldly you know, radio station that just plays the world's music all year round, but then actually turn one on and hear Songs that have good doctrine about our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know a lot of that is being phased out and stuff, and it's still just all about the reindeers and, and Frosty and all that stuff. But you can still hear that stuff. It's still something that's promoted. People are still saying Merry Christmas. And, and you know, it's a time of year where you're going you're gonna to hear a lot more Scripture being quoted. You're going to see it in print. I don't see that as a bad thing. I mean, the, and the point is still, and people still talk about it. I just heard it on, on talk radio last week. You know, well, what's the point of Christmas? Is it a religious holiday or not? But hey, they're still, they're still bringing up Christ. They're still bringing up, no, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior. And this is something that you can't get away with. It's a very good cultural holiday to have. I firmly believe this because even kids who grow up without any religion know about Christmas because you cannot escape it in our culture. Now, they may have some mixed up things. I think there's more about Santa Claus, but it's a great opportunity for them to hear about our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that nobody knows the exact day that Jesus was born. And I do not think that, oh no, December 25th, it's exactly, that's the day he was born. It doesn't matter which day we choose to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And, and, I, and that doesn't bother me one bit. I don't care. You could try tying that in to some other pagan holidays and everything else. It doesn't matter to me. I, I don't look at that. I, I don't think that that's, uh, I, mean, I have looked at that, but I didn't see any validity to it, especially when you look at what Christmas is and what it's been about for hundreds of years. I mean, what it's been about for a really long time. And, and going back, I, I don't know exactly the date, uh, you know, when people started celebrating Christmas, but it's about the, Savior, about the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's, to me, that, that's what matters. To me, it's a time when people are going out and, and singing Christmas carols, and, and you're, you're hearing these script, and a lot of these songs, we were singing songs this morning, they're packed with doctrine. They're good songs. It's a good time of year. It's a, it's a, it is a time to celebrate. We ought to be happy sometimes. We ought to be able to celebrate and not just be on the, t you know, just, just always in attack mode, right, or... or or in defense mode, but just be able to celebrate and, and say, hey, this is, this, is a, this is a great thing that happened. And we're going to read, as we, you know, we, of course, we started off in Luke chapter 2. And you know, one of the things, just, just a little personal tidbit for you, you know, with my family, every single Christmas day, we start off our Christmas day by reading through Luke chapter 2. And I read the Bible to my family. I sit everybody down. 
We don't, you know, go crazy with the presents first. We don't get crazy with the food or anything like that. We sit down. I read scripture to him and just explain. This is why we, this is why we celebrate today. It's all about Jesus Christ. And the reason why we give gifts is because we're thankful. It's a time of celebration. Jesus Christ is born. So one of the ways that we do that is with people that we love, we give gifts to them because it's a joyous time. And this is something that you could find even in scripture when there's days, when there's holy days, when there's days that, that thing, great things have happened. You can read it in the book of Esther. There was a great victory. There was a great deliverance. And how did, what did they do after that great victory? They celebrated it year after year after year after year by having feasts and giving gifts. That's the way people celebrate. So that's, why, that's how we celebrate Christmas. It's not about the presents. It's actually, if, you, if, it's, if you, any presents have anything to do with it, it's about giving the presents. I mean, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus Christ said that. And that's true. It's a fact. And that's one of the reasons why, why I give gifts, why, why we ought to give gifts, is because you want to be a blessing to someone else. You care about someone else, and we're celebrating. So we're, we're not going to lose sight of what Christmas is about. And this sermon this morning is about the birth of our Savior. And just to make sure that we're grounded and found with the, with the crazy world, with, with you know, everyone trying to get your attention, distracted on everything else that's going on, let's take some time to honor our Savior today and, and tomorrow with whatever that you do. And you know, let's, uh, let's focus on that. Let's not lose the meaning of this holiday. Now, as I mentioned before, this, you know, this, is a, this is a day where m many people take the time apart to spend with their family. And that is great. I think that's awesome. You know, sometimes it's the only times family members get together. And I believe in having a strong family and staying connected with your family. And, and, and during holiday time is a great time to do that. There's a strong emphasis on it. Um, it's a good thing to go through the extra efforts to, to be able to do that. But we just need to make sure, though, that we have our priorities right. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew 10, you don't have to turn, or you can stay in Luke 2. I'm just going to quote this for you, what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34. He said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And the, oh, the reason why I'm quoting this is at this time of year, there's oftentimes a, a, a strain or a stress on people to forsake church, to forsake going and actually, you know, honoring God in church among believers just so that you could spend time with the family. And we need to make sure that our priorities are right. I mean, to me, it's ridiculous. Now, last year, Christmas fell on a Sunday. December 25th was a Sunday. And like I said, a lot of you know, people take off of work. They do all the, go through all these extra efforts to spend time with family. Well, Sunday is a day that we always meet to, to worship and, and to you know, hold our church services and to hear from the Word of God. And Christmas Day is no different. In fact, I, I like it when Christmas Day falls on a Sunday just because, to me, it's, it's, it's really appropriate. I mean, if the day is supposed to be about celebrating Jesus Christ, what better way or place to do that than gathering together with a bunch of like-minded believers into one place and singing praises unto his name and hearing from the Word of God? To me, that's, that's the best way to celebrate. I wouldn't want to forsake that just to spend time with family. Now look, family is important. I'm a big proponent of spending time with your family. But we need to make sure that our loyalty lies in the right place. Ever since I reprioritized my life, now look, I was not perfect with this, and I'm still not perfect with it, but there, you know, there was a time where, to me, church wasn't that big of a deal. And I brought this up before, but the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 5 that, that uh, when it talks about husbands and wives, it says that husbands ought to love their wife even as Christ so loved the church and gave his life for it. If Jesus Christ gave his life for the church, I'm going to treat church as being important. 
I mean, it's, it's a place that, that, I, that I make sure is a priority in my life. Now, look, everybody is free. You know, I'm not telling you exactly what you have to do, but you need to determine for yourself what your priorities are. How important is something to me? Is it, is, it, is it important for me to go to church, you know, once a month, once a year, twice a year, you know, uh, every time the doors open, whatever? You make that decision and prioritize your life and then stick to that and don't compromise on that. I made my own decisions a long time ago when I started getting right with God, when I finally got plugged into a good church and, and started changing my life and saying, man, I need to do something different. I need to serve God. I decided church was important. I decided, hey, I need this. And the more I started to learn and grow, the more I realized, hey, I, I really need to be a part of this as much as I can. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go to church Sunday night, Sunday morning and Wednesday night, just every time there's a church service, I'm going to be there. And that's what I've done. Now, have I been perfect at it? No, of course not. I mean, you get sick, there's other things that come up, but that ought to be a very rare exception when you make a, a decision like that, when you say, this is a priority and I'm going to be here. And I remember personally in my life when I first started, you know, right after, shortly after I, I made this decision. And anytime you make a solid decision for God, you're just like, this is what I'm going to do. Watch out for that to be tested because the testing will come. And, you know, I'd made a trip to, uh, you know, to Chicago to visit family and stuff. And, and then the pressure was put on me after I made this decision. Well, what about, you know, like every, the whole family's coming together and it's going to be at this time and it's Sunday. And it's just like, well, I'll show up after church. Why? Because that's what was important to me. I'm like, this is, we're celebrating Christmas and it was the same type of thing. I'm going to go and do this. Do I want to spend time with my family? Yes, I do. I love my family. I want to see them. But you know what? I've set a priority where I say God's first in my life. And I'm not going to let anybody back me down on that or cause me to compromise on those convictions. Because once you start, and a lot of people I don't think realize this. You just want to go along to get along. You don't want to cause any problems with people. And you think, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, they're asking me to do this. So I'll just, this one, you know, I'll just not go to church. But when they already know that you're committed to church and then you compromise on that, that actually damages your testimony. When you've already, when people already know, oh, man, he's, you know, he's going to church. But once you make that stand one time, you know, I've only had to deal with that one time, that pressure. One or two times. I don't remember exactly how many times. A couple times. But after the first few times of you just being solid on, you know, say, no, this is where I stand. This is important to me. People will back off on it. It's not something you have to face all the time. And, uh, and you'll actually get respect from people from that too. To see, oh, wow, he actually is really serious about this. Oh, wow, this is something that's important to him. And a lot more good can come of that when you are solid in your faith and it shows. When you're not willing to just back down and be like, okay, well, we'll skip church. Okay, well, we'll skip soul today. Oh, okay, this is going on. And you start making, because what happens is when you allow yourself to just make compromises and excuses, it grows. It's going to build. Well, I already skipped for this, so why not skip for that? Oh, I skipped for this. I'm going to skip for that. And, and, and it just builds and it grows. And before you know it, you're backsliding. We need to make our own convictions based on our priorities and stick with them. So let's get into the chapter here, Luke chapter 2. Let's focus on what this day is all about. Because without the birth of the Savior, this church wouldn't even exist. There would be no reason for us to be here. We wouldn't be gathering together. Because we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if he was never born, then we wouldn't, you know, there would be no, no reason for us to, uh, to gather together in his name. And neither would this even be a holiday that we celebrate. So in Luke chapter 2, I just want to point out some of the, we're going to highlight some of the, the monumentous, just, just showing how monumentous this event really is. Uh, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior is born. Christ the Lord is born. And this is what was being heralded to the shepherds. The shepherds are being told this, you know, as this event's happening, they're saying, hey, this is a great day of joy. This is a happy time. 
Fear not. I'm bringing you good news. Jump down to verse number 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Again, just um, highlighting how, how great an event this was. It's such a great event that angels appear under these shepherds, and then as they're talking to them, there's this great heavenly host. A host is just, you know, a multitude or like a lot, you know, a bunch of people that are up in heaven praising God and saying. So they're, they're making this statement. I don't know if it's in song, but they're making this statement. Glory to God in the highest. Like, just because of this a day, because of this event, because Jesus Christ was born. Say, hey, glory to God. What a great day this is. Glory to God in us and on earth. Peace, good will toward men. This is a day where it's good will directed towards man. The good will is from God. God wants people to be saved. Why? Because there's a Savior born. God has given a gift to, the, to everybody on the earth. The gift of a Savior. The gift of a way out. The gift of, of eternal life through that Savior who's going to lead the world with his truth. And uh, let's jump down to verse number 29 here in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, 29. The Bible says, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. This is a story where Simeon, this man, this is an old man and an older lady come into the temple when Jesus Christ, um, I, I forget, was this after his circumcision or after the days of her purification? Either way, they come into the temple at the dedication of the child and um, this man, Simeon, sees he it was it was revealed to him that he was going to see the savior before he died so he sees jesus christ in the temple and verse 29 says lord now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the gentiles in the glory of thy people israel now this just shows here We've covered this a little bit in the book of Galatians. He knew this was, he was a light to all people, it was a blessing to all nations, to all people. He was a savior of the whole world, not just to one group of people, not just Israel, for everybody. He was a savior born and prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, saying, This is a savior. He's, gonna, he's here for everybody, to all people. This is not just about one group of people or anything like that. Look at verse number 38 then. This is when the, the widow woman uh, sees Jesus in verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So both of these people knew exactly what was going to happen. It was revealed to them. And they preached Jesus Christ. And they knew he was coming. They knew a Savior was coming. They knew Christ the Lord was coming. And as soon as they saw him, they knew, and, and she goes out and she, it says, she spake of him, talking about Jesus, to all them that looked for redemption. Oh, you want to be saved? Well, there is a Savior born. Jesus Christ, the Christ is here. The Messiah is here. This is a huge event between the heavenly host praising God, the angels appearing on the shepherds, two faithful people giving testimony, the birth of a savior. And then in another chapter, we see the wise men traveling from the east, you know, following the star just to give all these gifts to the king, to Jesus Christ, the kingly gifts that they give. This is a big deal. This is why we celebrate this day. It was a, a big deal was made about it when Jesus Christ was born. And we're going to honor and commemorate this day and make it a big deal. We're going to talk about it. We're going to prepare for it. We're going to get people together. We're going to, we're going to enjoy fellowship and have feasts and, and, and give gifts because this is such a great event. And anyone who's saved this morning knows how great of an event that is because you, Jesus Christ is your Savior and he's paid for all of your sins and you're trusting on him to get to heaven. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. Matthew and Luke provide us with details on the physical birth of Jesus Christ into this world as a man. We see that. We see how he was born. You know, there was no room for them in the inn. Jo when Joseph and Mary were going to be taxed, they were going to Jerusalem. And on the way, because Mary's pregnant, 
She has to give birth. Of course, they, they go to try to, to get a place at an inn or a hotel. They're trying to, to get a room somewhere, and every, you know, everything's full. There's, there's, there's no room for them. They're not able to, to find a place to stay, so they have to go um, just, just kind of out in, in whatever shelter they could find. And Jesus is born, and he's laid in a manger. And um, you know that whole story is given to us in Matthew and Luke. There's a lot of details on that. But John provides us unequivocally that Jesus was not just a man. He is not just any man. He's not just, oh, this is a story of a birth of a man who's a real good teacher or a good man, someone that could teach us some things, instruct us. John actually shows us that he was God in the flesh. Amen. While you read the, the accounts of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke, John, from the very beginning in John chapter 1, shows us Jesus Christ is not just an ordinary man. He's actually God in the, event, in the flesh. And this accentuates the significance of this event. The day that God clothed himself in flesh and took on the human limitations of a man that we face. And it makes it very more personal and it makes our Savior a lot more personal to us just knowing that God did this. Look at John chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this is, this is speaking to the Trinity, the three in one, the triune God or Godhead that we believe in. God consists of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that these three are one. And we believe that wholeheartedly here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. And we see that here. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was. Well, how can the Word be with God and be God at the same time? Because he's part of that three in one. How could I be standing here as one person but have a body, a soul, and a spirit? Well, because we're made after the image of God. Verse number two. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jump down to verse number 10. He was in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 14 there is how we know for a certainty that the word, was referring to the word in John 1, 1, that that's talking about Jesus Christ. Because when it says the Word was made flesh, the Word was in the beginning with God. The Word was God, and that same Word became flesh and dwelt among us and dwelt on this earth among people. And we, it says we, because this is John writing, of course the Apostle John is writing this book. He says, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the Word made flesh, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And we know the only begotten of the Father is talking about Jesus Christ. We get that later in the book, but uh, full of grace and truth. And, and this is just an amazing concept to grasp that, that God became a man and experienced the things that we experienced. I want to um, just point out one more thing. There is a, there is a, a prophecy in the book of Micah and you can turn there if you'd like, Micah 5, 2. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. About God becoming a man, about God becoming flesh, about our Savior coming to this earth. And that Savior is God. In Micah 5, 2. The Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, 
whose goings forth have been from old, from of old, from everlasting. So this prophecy in the Old Testament, in the book of Micah, is saying out of Bethlehem is going to be, is going to arise someone who's going to be the ruler in Israel and his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So from eternity past. Who comes from everlasting? Nobody does but God. God is the only being or person that's pre-existed everything. Why? Because God created everything. Everything else has a starting point when God made it. But God has no beginning. He has no end. There is no starting point with God. So who is being who is the ruler in Israel that's being prophesied here? Jesus Christ, because he's from everlasting, showing again that God was going to come in the flesh to be the ruler of Israel. Now, this is just one example of why it is so important which Bible you use. This verse here in Micah 5, 2, what, the way that this reads in the NIV, I'll read it for you, is, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you, are very, very, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, there's two problems with this verse right off the bat that, that should jump right out of you. One of them is it says, whose origins... Now, if something has an origin, that's a beginning. It's when it was originated, right? It is when it came into being. Did Jesus Christ come into being? Did, did he have an origin? Was Jesus Christ a created being? As the Jehovah's Witnesses want you to believe? Or as the Mormons want you to believe? No. In the King James, it says, whose goings forth, not his origins, an origin is a beginning. Jesus doesn't have a beginning. He's without father, without mother, without descent, without beginning of days, nor end of life. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus Christ that way. And um, so there it says his origins, and then it says from of old, from ancient times. From ancient times isn't the same from everlasting. You know, ancient is very old. What we call it, consider ancient, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, you could consider that ancient, right? Ancient history. But even that, I mean, that insinuates there's a, there's a starting point. I mean, there's, there's just some date. Yeah, you go back, but it's not talking about going back forever and ever and ever, predating time from everlasting. Very, very important. And, and you know, this is just one example I'm throwing. At the, this sermon is definitely not about Bible versions, but... It fit in well, and I like to bring it up from time to time because it's such an important issue, and it's so important for us to get good doctrine that we're actually getting it from the Word of God. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to see a little bit more depth into, into how God literally became a man and our appreciation that God actually became a man. And what that means to us. Hebrews chapter number 2. We're going to look at verse number 9 in Hebrews chapter 2. The Bible reads, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus Christ, when he came into this world in his fleshly body, was made a little lower than the angels because the, 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 the human body, the physical body, is actually a little bit lower than God had made the angels. You know, there's the celestial bodies, there's these um, you know, angelic bodies and beings. And the way that what Jesus came in, just like us, we're a little bit lower than the angels on the totem pole. Now, of course, one day the Bible says that we're going to be ruling and reigning, even the angels. You know, God's going to give us, you know, he's going to exalt us and lift us up. But when, you know, when Jesus came in as a man, he was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death. He says, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. You know, he came in 
You could say with dishonor, he came in to a humble beginning, being born out on the road somewhere in whatever shelter that they could find, born with not much, not much of anything. And I didn't really go into this at all, but in Luke chapter 2, you'll see that what they offered was, um, it says, according to the law for the purification, they offered two young pigeons or turtle doves. When you go back to the law, in God's in the Mosaic law for when, when a, a son is born and, and what is supposed to be offered as a sacrifice, it's actually, um, I want to say like a, a lamb or a bullock is supposed to be offered, but if you don't have the money, if you, if you don't have the wealth, if, if you simply can't afford that, then the two birds is enough. They're saying that's why, because God understands not everyone will have the means or the finances because, I mean, everyone has kids, right? Whether, whether you're rich or poor, everyone has children. And he says, well, you can at least afford to get a couple of birds to, you know, for your sacrifice. And that's what Joseph and Mary offered up as their sacrifice, just kind of demonstrating they didn't have the resources to give the, the, the better offering or the, you know, the more expensive one. And God has this acceptable, but that's what they gave. So Jesus came into this world with very humble beginnings. I mean, the King of kings and Lord of lords came into this earth with nothing, really. I mean, he was, he was born in a, in, a, in a shelter, not even um, having a lot of care, but um, I mean, the care of his parents, of course, but not, not any other feed. Uh, it wasn't in some state-of-the-art hospital or anything like that, right? However, people might think would be a, a, the best place for him to be born. But no, he was, he was out in the elements and uh, had a very humble beginning. And he came in that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He came in with a mission that wasn't something that people would probably be looking forward to. The, the, the purpose of Jesus Christ coming into this world was to live the perfect life, to obey God in full obedience, and then ultimately to offer up himself as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. Not for his own, to pay for someone else, the things that other people did, laws that, that other people broke. Commandments that other people broke. So I'm going to go and pay for your sins. And I'm going to face the cross. And I'm going to face that death. And I'm going to face that shame as God in the flesh. It's amazing. Verse number 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So as much as the children, as talking about us, we are children of, uh, we're partakers of flesh and blood. This is how we're born. He also himself likewise took part of the same in order to destroy death and the devil and the evil that he brought into this world. Verse number 15, and, to deli and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, because God could have taken any nature on him that he wanted to. He didn't take the nature of angels. No, he went a little bit lower than that. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Jesus had to come in the flesh because his perfect sinless blood 
was needed to be shed in order for our sins to be remitted. According to God's law and the punishment that goes along with our sins, he had to come. He had to be the faithful priest that was going to stand for us to God. He was going to be the one who did everything right. Everything, the way that God laid it out for, there was going to be a man that was going to be able to arise, Jesus Christ, that could keep God's law and then can stand and fill the gap between us and God and offer up himself as that blood sacrifice to pay for the sins of the whole world. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 4, just a page or two over to the right in your Bible from chapter 2, chapter 4. Verse number 14, the Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's so many aspects of Jesus Christ that I love and, and, and just reading into and looking at from Scripture. He was tempted in all points like as we are. Jesus knows firsthand what it's like to go through all the trials, all the tribulations, all the sorrows, all the griefs, everything that could come your way in life. Jesus knows what it's like to go through those things. He has firsthand knowledge. You cannot say to God, well, you don't know what it's like to be. Yes, he does. You know, your kids or other people like to tell you, well, you don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what it's like to walk in my shoes. You don't know what it's like to be Jesus. Jesus knows what it's like to be flesh. But he was able to do it without sin. We get tempted. We face problems and, and, and troubles, and we make wrong, wrong choices. And we break God's laws. And we do the wrong things. Jesus never did that, yet he experienced the same thing. You don't know how hungry I was. Yes, Jesus knows. I had to steal that bread, or I had to do this. Or, you know, the excuses that we come up with to try to justify our actions, Jesus had the same opportunity, and he had the same weaknesses as far as the flesh is concerned, but he did everything right. And see, this is, this is good news, so don't, don't take this the wrong way because what the Bible is saying here is that he was tempted in, in all points like as we are yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, knowing that we have a Savior that knows how we feel, that knows what it's like, that's been through it. We could come boldly with confidence unto our Savior that we could obtain mercy. God wants us to go to, God knows what it's like to be in this flesh for us. So no, we know that he knows that, so we could come boldly and just ask God for mercy and, and go to the Lord and find grace to help in time of need. When we are struggling, when we're going, God, I don't know what else I can do. God, I feel like I'm going to sin. You know, we could go to God. God knows what it's like and God will help you. And God will show you mercy. But you know what? He wants you to go to him. You have to go to him. That's the key is actually going to him. Too many people want to just deal with everything on their own. And especially guys, I know what this is like. You want to handle everything on your own. You don't want help from anybody. I'm not asking anyone for directions. I'm going to do this on my own and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to die trying. And I'm going to do it again. Look, we need to be able to swallow our pride a little bit and go to God when we need help. When we are facing uh, troublous times or times of temptation, hey, let's go boldly under the throne of grace and obtain that mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows firsthand what we go through. The Bible says in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ, he came into this world, born of humble beginnings, lived the perfect life, just to die for wicked sinners. And that should show you how much Jesus loves you, how much God loves you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
parents probably understand this more than anyone as far as the, when, you, when you experience the birth of a child and the amount of love you have. And we see the joyous occasion that happened when Jesus Christ was physically born into this world. And it was a big event. And you know what? When you have your first child and your second, any children, it's a big event. It's a big deal. There's a lot of love there. It's, 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 I mean, your whole world stops because this is such a big event of having that child. And the love that you have for that child is, is indescribable. And knowing that love that you have, imagine, imagine giving your child for someone else. For someone who's spoken bad about you. For someone who, who has no respect for you. To give that life, that's the love that God has for us. His only begotten son. His only one. I mean, I, I praise God that, 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 you know, I've got more than one. But think, I mean, just, just having one. This is my only begotten son. And I'm going to give that. Probably the, the best thing, you know, one of the best things that can happen in this life for us is, you know, have a child. So what a blessing that is. And then to give that up and to give that up for people who are undeserving and in, and in most cases don't even want it have nothing to do with them. But God gave anyways. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us it's an amazing sacrifice it's an amazing gift what a great reason to celebrate it's humbling we ought, we ought to be humbled and, and, and to thank God our creator that he didn't just turn his back on us that even though we're, we're flesh and we, and, we, and we do many things that are, that are not right, He chose to love us and to give and to sacrifice for us. Let's reflect that love towards other people. Let's demonstrate that love and show other people what God has done and share that hope. We have hope. We have hope in this life. We have a hope through our Savior. The Savior that was born some 2,000 years ago. Let's spread that hope. Let's tell other people about that hope. This is a great time of year to do it. If you ever worried about, I don't know how to give the gospel to someone or I need an icebreaker, there is not a better time than one of these holidays, you know, Easter, or Christmas, Every, you know, it's about Jesus anyways. Bring it up and say, did you realize, I mean, did you ever really stop to think about it just for a second, what God did for us? Did you ever stop to think just for, I mean, get alone with somebody, get that time where you can actually have a good conversation. Pull someone away as you're celebrating today or tomorrow or whenever you see family and you know that someone's not saved. Hey, take a time, love that person, as God loved you, pull them aside from the group and just say, hey, did you ever really think about what we're celebrating? And what God really did for us? And preach the gospel to them. And explain the love that God has for them and the gift that he has, the free gift, no strings attached, of receiving eternal life. Just as we give gifts to, to, to people that we love, explain that free gift of salvation. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us and for all that you do. Dear God, I pray that you please help us have a good testimony and help us to reflect the, um, the type of attitude that you had to um, come into this world and, and to love those that didn't love you back and to, to offer up a great sacrifice. And um, Lord, help us to, to share that with as many people as we possibly can. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ.
but that we would boldly proclaim the good news as you've instructed us to do, dear Lord. Help us to, to reach as many people as possible. Lord, we thank you. We're humbled. We, we love you. And, um, and sometimes it's hard to find the words, dear God, but uh, we, we truly are appreciative of what you've done for us and, and how much you've, you love us, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.